All right. Also, World War One would trigger suffrage. Women's suffrage that they have been fighting for years in the United States, the women's rights movement. Before the war, Wilson actually pledged his support, but he actually really didn't mean it. But the war would finally push suffrage over just as did prohibition. Alice Paul, who's here and here, would become the most vocal leader of the suffrage movement, and she believed in direct action. They had to do direct action to get the right to vote, to force President Wilson and the progressives that were in Congress, both Republican and Democrat, to do what they swore they would do. And Alice Paul is truly one of the great Americans in our history, and unfortunately she has been forgotten almost. A pretty amazing person. She went to Britain and learned a little bit of her trade, and then it would actually teach them after the war. And after fighting for this, and what happened was, we'll read the sign. And look what they're calling Alice Paul. What they call Alice Paul, or what she's calling the, the president, is the Kaiser. You think she's going to be imprisoned? That's potentially a direct violation of what two laws? And sedition. Yeah. And so, she would be in prison. This is Alice Paul in prison. And this is a protest outside, and because she is a political prisoner, being held because she wants the right to vote. She says, regardless of war, we demand the right to vote. And in prison, she would go through a hunger strike. And just like what happened in Britain, what would happen to her? They were force fed. A tube would be put through her nose, through her sinus cavity, down her throat, and would be force fed. And by the way, it's a steel tube. <clears throat> this is torture. By any definition, they tortured her because she demanded suffrage. But by taking it, by looking like they're on the side of right, this forced President Wilson and mostly Democrats, but also some Republicans, to finally say, yes, we will have women's or suffrage. Congress would pass, and in 1920, the states would ratify the 19th Amendment. And they would dub it the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, and that would allow for women's suffrage. Southern states were the last one. Tennessee, actually one member of their state house, literally switched his vote, and Tennessee would finally ratify it, and they would... Uh, and they would, uh, or women without suffrage. I remember Montana already had this in 1914. One more thing, Alice Paul after that, also wanted to rectify one other big problem in the Constitution, and she would write the Equal Rights Amendment in 1921, and it would be voted on time after time, which all the Equal Rights Amendment said is there can be no discrimination based upon sex. That is still not the law. So women to this day are not guaranteed equal rights. So Alice Paul would write that, she get one major success, but women are still not equal under the Constitution. Yes? What were the arguments against that and the 19th Amendment? Well, we'll, th we'll talk about the ERA a little bit later, so let's save that one. We get to the 19th Amendment. The idea against women's rights is that women aren't as smart, and so why would you want people who aren't as smart and not, not qualified to vote to vote? They would only vote the way their husbands wanted them to vote, or women would be frivolous and vote for whatever handsome man would be present. Basically saying that women were inferior. And so, one more big thing happened. The Spanish flu. Where did the Spanish flu begin, by the way? Kansas. It began in Kansas. But... It's, it's unclear the origins of Spanish flu. It's something to do with the Spanish ship. But it began in Kansas because of the war. Basically, almost certainly because uh, train, uh, boot camps were hastily built on flat areas for boot camps and western Kansas and contracted it there from some animals that weren't really around people that much. But the big reason why this was so bad is a combination of it started in Kansas with troops. Well, the troops are going to get on trains, and they're going to go to Philadelphia. That was the main part of port of embarkation to go to Europe. Well, what happened? All along 
the train routes, they spread the flu. So the first big breakout would be in Philadelphia. And then these troops would get on ships and spread it all over Europe. And soon, an international pandemic, starting in Kansas. And these are a couple of examples. Masks would be, would be one of the symbols of it to try to avoid the spreading of it. I like this one, malted milk, diet during and after influenza. There's a shortage of bedding because of the flu. Don't spit, causes the flu. Well, we don't know exactly how many people died, but because of the war, it's anywhere from 20 to 40 million people. And this is a, a tragedy of unprecedented proportions. We really don't know how many died. Almost half of the American war dead died because the Spanish flu um, raged in the trenches. You can imagine how in the trenches they'd be much more susceptible to the flu. And so that's why the total number of American military dead in World War I is 120,000. Over 120,000, over 60,000 died in combat. 60,000 died of the flu because they were in the trenches because the flu spread. This broke down society, just broke it down. People refused to travel, they didn't want to go see their neighbors. Things like postal service broke down. Delivery men must have been spreading it. Food transportation broke down. No one's gonna deliver, spread the flu. Now, at least 100,000 American civilians died because of this, and that's awful. But think 100,000 out of about 90 million. That'd be like 450,000 today. And society shut down. Can you imagine what would happen today? This one is much more easily transferred, and here's the other reason why it was so bad. Young or young adults were hit the hardest. Young adults were hit harder than what normally happens in these kind of illness where it's young or the elderly. Because their body reacted so violently against the disease that it sent their body into shock and killed them. And so you combine this with the war dead, and there's going to be what we call, and we'll come back to it, a lost generation. And this is an interesting little gif. Why is it working? Work. There we go. See how it spreads Philadelphia, the first world big impact, and then pretty soon all over the country. In a month. In a month. That's a mass grave in Philadelphia. Had to get the bodies underground. Yeah. Did the Allies try and use that against the Germans? No, they didn't really. It, it spread. It didn't happen. So it just happened anyway. Actually, it hit both sides really bad. Hmm? No, the virus adapts and changes too fast. And uh, and you'd have, you know, and for you know, they would try to weaponize other diseases and other biological warfare. You know, people are that insane to do things like that. So, while the flu is raging, the U.S. is building up a force. And it's going to be called the American Expeditionary Force for the AEF. And General John Blackjack Pershing, right here in Mexico, chasing Pancho Villa, he would be given command. Not a brilliant commander, but very, very stable and consistent. Those are American troops. And the nickname for troops coming into this war, they had a nickname before, but it would become very common were Doughboys. Doughboys. It is also in this war that Uncle Sam, which we all saw in that picture, and it was also in your DPQ, Uncle Sam, that replaced Lady, completely replaced Lady Columbia as a citizen or the symbol of the United States. There's a lot of, probably came from the Mexican War where Doughboys came from. It's Uncle Sam from the War of 1812. But one thing about the AEF that's very important. The United States decided that it would fight as an American army. The British and French wanted these soldiers just to be plugged in as replacements for British or French dead. And Pershing said no. This infuriated the Allies. Looking back, it might have been the right choice, but you can understand why they'd be infuriated. There'd be a couple hundred thousand American soldiers arriving every month by the summer of 1918. But they could not fight as a big unit until August of 1918. And so there's a lot of months there where they needed these soldiers. Well, what we're coming up to, though, is two things. First off, President Wilson's 14 points. 
January of 1914. Now, don't write down all 14. I'll tell you what you need to know from it. President Wilson would give a speech where he laid out his vision of peace called the 14 points. And pretty soon the 14 points are going to take almost this mystical appeal. Like this will bring world peace. This cartoon tries to show it. The 14 points is, bar is barring imperialism and war with the lance from getting through. So there will be world peace. And this was seen as this very idealistic vision. It's completely unrealistic. But Wilson would issue these. And if you look at these, it sounds very basic, but it doesn't understand the complexities of the world. There are four things you need to know. First one, freedom of the seas. What he wanted was freedom of the seas so you can lift those economic barriers. What did I say? Barriers. Barriers. Freedom of the seas. Next, in the arms race. Wilson brought up a very good point. The arms race led to World War I. We saw that in the documents for the DBQ. By building these weapons and dreadnoughts, that caused countries to go to war. Do you want the United States to be like that? Oh, we will be. And then, all the rest, adjustment of colonial claims to deal with the conquered territories of Russia, areas conquered by Germany. Belgium, France, Italy, division of Austria, redrawing the Balkans, limitation of Turkey, independent Poland. All these combined as this, write down self-determination. What he talked about was self-determination, especially Poland, which Poland's mentioned specifically. Let all these little nationalities decide their own fate. The problem is, there's a hodgepodge of different people living in these areas. Who's going to have their own country? It sounds good when it actually works. Who's going to want it? And then colonies? This is implying independence. You think Britain's going to get rid of the colonies? We just fought this war for colonies. Are you crazy? And so this would be it very quickly. Even Wilson would realize that what he said wouldn't be workable. But people would talk about the 14 points. And when the war would end, Wilson the thought was Wilson would bring his 14 points and end war forever. He would be seen as a conquering hero. He would leave in the middle of the night. So we got self determination Oh, I forgot one more thing. Self-determination, freedom of the seas, arm in arm race, and the last one. Some kind of association of nations that's going to be called, write down, the League of Nations. An international body that represented this from all the countries, there were less than 40 countries then, would come together and they could stop problems before they turned to war. An avenue for diplomacy. On the surface, this is a very liberal policy. And we'll talk more about liberal and conservative later. The League of Nations, and that would be his big. The League of Nations would eventually happen, but not at all the way Wilson thought. Today, what is the very weak equivalent of the League of Nations? You have nine nations. So, hmm? that's different. European Union is more of an economic union. Hindenburg and Ludendorff, remember they're the German commanders? Remember they had the Treaty of Brest Litovsk. American troops are arriving. They decided before Americans can arrive in one in large numbers, one more big attack. One more big offensive. 23 divisions, over a million German soldiers were now freed up to go to the Western Front for one more attack. This is uh, Hindenburg, there's the Kaiser, there's Ludendorff. And Ludendorff is the planner. He's the man who makes all the plans. The brains, even though he's vastly overrated, the brains of the operation. And we generically call this the Spring Offensive, March 1918, the Spring Offensive. It's also called the Kaiser's Offensive. The first attack would be called Michael. We're just going to call it the Spring Offensive. And the Germans are going to use new tactics that they've been developing over the last couple of years. 
The French also were developing the same ones. The British, not really, the Americans were so. The Americans would use the same thing they did in 1914 and 1915. That's why their casualties were so high. They used French. Yeah. Brave mowed down in waves. What their plan was this short, quick bombardment of shells and gas, and then specially trained troops. Here they are. Here they are. Would not advance in a line. They advanced in small units, infiltrate the enemy, get behind them. They would carry big burlap bags of grenades, have new weapons called submachine guns for firepower, and they would get behind the enemy, isolating strong points and moving into the rear. Anybody know what they called these units right here? Stormtroopers. That is the term stormtroopers, specially trained. And yes, once again, the Darth Vader lookalike with stormtroopers. And it worked. It worked. For the first time since 1914, stalemate was broken. They broke through the German or the French lines, or the British lines first, and then later would break through the French and advance miles into the rear. And they actually, for the first time in the war, they cavalry was brought out to try to exploit it. It didn't really work. But they thought, for the first time, this map shows how far they advanced. Huge breakouts. The first attack broke all the way to here. And they ran out of supplies. They thought they might go to the sea and cut the British off. And then Ludendorff didn't know what to do. They did four more offense here, 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 and here. He didn't really have a goal. Was it to cut off the British? Was it to take Paris? They figured out how to break through the lines, but not what to do. These attacks in 1918 would be the precursor to what German style of attack in World War II? Did anyone know? Blitzkrieg. So they broke through. When they got to the Allied trenches, the German soldiers were told the British are starving. The British are out of food. The Germans had been told the U boats are starving them to death. Germany's literally out of food. So they're told they're starving. They're just as bad as you are. And they believed it. And when they got to the British trenches and then the French trenches, what did they find? All kinds of food like they hadn't seen since 1914. Two things happened. First off, German discipline broke down because I was stopping eight. Right? Right? But the next thing is really crucial. The German soldiers realize they've been lying to us. They've been lying to us the whole time. It is like all their illusions were shattered with one failed blow. They have been lying to us. If they've been lying to us about this, what else have they been lying to us about? Hmm? Everything about the war, but attrition, that the war is winning, the reason they got into the war, would they lie afterwards? This will begin. This will be the root of the end of the German Empire. Right there. Ironically, when they broke the stalemate and were advancing, the problem is, too, then, the first German soldiers to die are going to be these specially trained stormtroopers. And eventually, the Allies are going to push them back. Two things. First off, American forces would finally, Pershing would allow them to join British and French forces right here to stop the German advance. This attack is going to be called. <laughs> I'll get to it, I'll get to it. I got it in the wrong order. Two places. The first American forces are going to fight in a little forest about 80 miles from Paris called Bella Wood. This is a drawing of Bella Wood. An entire Marine battalion was actually surrounded by German forces who would have to fight their way out. They're called the Lost Battalion, so you can go there and visit in Bella Wood. And they finally did break their way out. So it's going to become part of like marine mythology. And then at Chateau Terry, American troops stopped the last German attack. This is made in the United States, so you know that it says the turning point of, world, of the World War. Yay, America! But this really did make a big difference. The Germans could do the math. This is by the summer of 1918, their offensive had failed. I tried to go both places there years ago, but I couldn't go because they had all the tents off. Because this area is also open for for grazing of cattle, and Wolfenbach was going through. 
And they wouldn't let you go if they swept them out, but so contagious. So I couldn't actually go in there. You know what the mouth disease is? Yeah, it's contagious amongst cows. Stupid cows. So I couldn't go. But let's backtrack. One, two more things. I just found this interesting. The, French, the Germans actually devised a gun that could shoot 60 miles, a hobbits. And that's it. 208 millimeters. The gun barrel itself is almost 20 yards long. And it can hit Paris from 60 miles away. It can actually hit England from one gun. Did they ever do it? Yeah, they shell Paris. There are shell holes in Paris where they hit. It was terror. A terror weapon, but still an amazing technical device. And the Allies finally decided on an overall command. Marshal Ferdinand Foch, Marshal Foch, a French commander, would be the overall commander of all Allied forces. And he would initiate the first offensive. These are French soldiers now driving the Germans back. Actually, doing really well all of a sudden. There's Foch right there. And these are Allied commanders. Uh, Belgium. That's Marshal Batan, the French commander, but the, the French overall commander. There's General Haig, the British commander, and now it's Field Marshal Haig. There's General Pershing, the American commander. Marshal Foch, and Foch was determined to defeat the Germans. And Foch, once again, not a brilliant general, but the kind of man they needed. He stabilized the front and organized a counteroffensive. And he would become a great hero of France. He would die in 1929. But this is new, this is current. Obviously, Foch is popular in France, and so this woman got a Ferdinand Foch back tattoo. <laughs> now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. I want one of these. Yes, I'm with you. So, I decide to make it worth your while. I will give you three extra credit points if you get this. No, let me sweeten the deal. I will also give you three extra credit points in your English class. Too. <laughs> no, hey, I'll give you 400 extra credit points in English. <laughs> you go tell your English teacher, show the tattoo and say, Mr. Partridge gave this to us. Oh, yeah, I have that power. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Cooney may get the tattoo, I think you get the points. That is just outright awesome. I, I would I would try I would call your parents immediately and say uh, your son and or daughter does not know understand the meaning of a joke. I feel like you have to give four credit. Four? I'm giving you four hundred in English, two hundred math. Let me finish. And if anyone's in Latin, a thousand. All right, yes. not online, online to joke. Okay, <laughs> and then August of 1918, August of 1918, the Allies began their offense. And this offense, before anything else, was just going to be a precursor to, to Foch's grand offense, even 1919. But as it turned out, it would end the war. In fact, in France, they'll call it the 100 days, because the war went in 100 days. And the French and the British attacked here and here. The Americans actually fought right here. They gave them the worst part of the line, this really heavily forced area called the Argonne. You know, Pershing's like, we'll take it. It was awful. Just awful. The Argonne. Isn't that better, especially if you fight against machine guns against those trees? But what happens is it makes every inch easier to defend. It's rough ground. It's just awful. That's Americans attacking to a gas attack. That's a pretty cool picture, isn't it? And those are Americans in the Argonne. Look, that's heavily forested. Look what happens by the shelling. And it's a French forest. You know, rains there a lot. And that's American troops just exhausted. Look at their faces coming back. There'd be 100,000 American casualties in about 90 days in the Argonne forest. The Argonne forest. Hell on earth. But, but, the British and French also begin to advance. And on one day in August that Ludendorff would call the Black Day of the German Army, hundreds of thousands of Germans surrendered. The first time in the war. Look at that. Those are prisoners held by the French. Look at all those. 
Ludendorff called this the Black Day, and they never recovered. He lost his mind. Ludendorff was always unstable. He lost it. Especially during these fights, his stepson died, and he, he was very close to his stepson, and he had the body brought to his headquarters, and he would keep the body with him for over a month. He had the body like would sleep in the bed. He would lay it in the bed. I mean, he just he lost his mind. The stress of the war. So let's put it this way: the German high command lost it, and then in the next couple months, it just total collapse. <coughs> the German army itself didn't totally collapse, but everything else did. The the Ottomans finally surrendered very quickly. The Bulgarians surrendered. Soon the Austrians surrendered. These are German soldiers captured by the French and the British. And then in November, Germany itself exploded in civil war. And the roots of this is that March offensive, we have been lied to. We have been lied to. Germany exploded in 1918. And this, this, this is Elvis. This right here. All these areas are showing how the revolt spread. It started with the, the fleet, the Navy right here refused to go out on one more mission, and they mutinied, and it spread throughout Germany. Food riots and anti-German riots, these are actually communists in Berlin that for a short time tried to take over Berlin. Germany just erupted. The Kaiser did what he always assumed would happen. Well, we'll send troops out to stop them. And Hindenburg made it very clear. No, we're done. And the Kaiser very quietly fled. He abdicated on November 9th. He went to the Netherlands, just kind of showed up. Here I am. He would die in the Netherlands in 1942, chopping wood. Yes. It's very awkward, too, because Germany would take the Netherlands in 1940, World War II. And they didn't know what to do with the guys, so they just ignored them. You know, they weren't sure. Do we bring them back? Do we talk about them? And then we want this crazy guy. So, what year did he abdicate? 1918, and Germany would sue for peace. They wanted an armistice, which means an end of fighting. Armistice is another word for ceasefire. And if you look at this, they asked for it on the 14 points. On the 14 points. But the Allies said, no, nope. you agree to whatever we want and we'll cease fire. Foch actually didn't want to quit at first. He wanted to drive into Germany and totally defeat their army. Because he was worried if we don't totally defeat them, what will the Germans do? They'll come back. And he was exactly right. 1929. But they would finally agree to an armistice. And they could have done it on the 10th, but they decided to do it on the dramatic date of the 11th. So they could get the war to end all wars. On the 11th of the 11th day of the 11th month. That is why Armistice Day will be on November 11th. And then after World War II, in the United States, they changed it to what's in November 11th? Huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Veterans Day, thank you. Jackson said it right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you and then you try to take credit for it. Good job, Cody. No, we thought about politics. All right, so <laughs> so <laughs> in in back in Canada, in France, it's Remembrance Day. So that's day for a month there they were a poppy. <coughs> These are American soldiers. Celebrating it's over. Yeah, at 1055, everybody fired everything they had up in the air. Everything. Fired everything. And then 11 o'clock, silence. 11 in the morning. And then it was just kind of like. So they fired gas too. Except, yeah, except for the gas shells. But they fired all the other rounds. They're shooting in the air. Did anyone die? Yeah. That's what I was thinking. So, I love this first thing. Oh, they signed an armistice. I love Kaiser, please, to Holland. And they made him sign on this train. And this is, I'm just telling you this story. Well, let's, go, let's come back to that. Where's my mouse? I love this one. 
Germany's flag day. Get it? Yeah, those witty Brits. These are Americans in Philadelphia celebrating when the war is over. A false story got back to the US that the war ended on November 7th. And so all over the United States, there were huge parties. People you know, celebrated all night and found out no, the war wasn't over. So in the United States, you know, the, the 11th was kind of subdued because everybody was still kind of hung over from the 11th or the 7th. But the French brought him to a train near the forest at Bella Wood at Compiègne. And this is the train it would become a kind of a traveling memorial. And this train, there's Marshal Foch right there. And they forced the Germans to surrender. In essence, was a, or a, an armistice that in essence was a surrender. The Germans had to march home and they had to give up their fleet, a number of things. And this would become an important memorial in France in 1940 when France very shockingly surrendered in World War II, at least the first part of World War II in 1940. Hitler, there he is, made the French surrender in that very same rail car and then blew it up. So it's gone. Well, the war is over. Those are American dead at the Ar are gone. That's what they held the gas mask in. Got out right here so you can get it up quickly. And they're digging a temporary, you can see the temporary cemetery. There's a huge American cemetery in the Argonne, it's right near Verdun. So go to the French battlefield of Verdun, about 10 miles away, it's a massive American cemetery from World War One then. And this gives us a basic idea of the number of combatants. I can mention 12 million Russians, 11 million Germans would fight in this war, four and a half million American soldiers and sailors. And this is the dead. And so of the dead here, Russia lost officially 1.7 million and probably 2 million more. Just dead. Germany lost nearly 2 million. The United States, about 100,000. Total dead officially was 8.1 million soldiers. They always estimate around 9 million soldiers because we don't know how many died in Russia and the East and in Turkey. And then this does not count the civilians. At least that number of civilians died. Everyone got that. So at least 18 to 20 million. You combine that with the flu and the Russian Civil War, and we're talking over 60 million people worldwide died from 1914 to 1920. And the war did not end in the East. It kept raging over these new countries. The world would be shocked by this. All these countries would be forever changed. Nobody more than France. France never recovered. France would never be the same to this day. And if you go to every French village, right in the center of the town is a memorial to World War I. They want it, but at a horrific cost because their population was not as great. Their most industrialized regions were destroyed in the war. They never recover. But one more thing we have to add, that the people who died that age, in the 1920s, it's going to be called, everybody write down, the lost generation. You combine this with the flu, and there's going to be a hole in some of these countries of young men and some women because of the flu. Because so many young women died because of that age group of the flu. They're not going to be the same, this generation. And those who survived the war, They're not like they were when they left. It's going to be this generation that will go in the Great Depression. It's going to be this generation in some of these countries like Germany that will become Nazis, combined with the blockade generation of children. And so the war is over. But I didn't put this down. Right down, the Allies kept the blockade going for six months. The Allies did not stop the blockade. And the war is over. Yay, the war is over. There's civil war in Eastern Europe, literal civil war. All these nationalities want their own country. And so when the allied powers would meet, in what city did they meet in? Huh? Paris. They met in Paris. They met in Paris to talk peace 
there's still war going on. In the Ottoman Empire, there's fighting. Heck, Greece is going to invade Turkey. Insanely. There's fighting in Central Europe. There's fighting in China. There's fighting in the Soviet Union. And Germans hadn't surrendered in Africa until 1919. And we're coming up to what we generically call the Treaty of Versailles. Versailles is the old, or it's the palace of Louis XIV outside of Paris. So they would force the Germans to sign the treaty there. But the treaty negotiation was in, was in Paris. And a couple things. First off, we have to get these people on what they want. Georges Clemenceau was the socialist pre premier of France. He's right there, a tough old politician. And Clemenceau, in fact, Clemenceau demanded that the treaty is going to be, we're going to do it in Paris. We won this war. France bore the brunt of this war. The treaty's going to be in Paris, and we don't care what the British say. Clemenceau, and this is what he wanted, write down, make sure Germany doesn't do it again. Does that sound logical? Yeah, that's pretty logical. Germany defeated France back in 1871. Germany nearly got them in 1914, 19, and 1918 to make sure Germany doesn't do it again. Now, history is going to say that he wanted to punish Germany. Well, yeah, they wanted revenge. But the goal was to make sure Germany didn't do it again. How do you stop Germany from doing it again? That's very arguable. But remember, Germany forced Russia to sign that horrific Treaty of Brest with Haas. And they're thinking, if they did it to Russia, we're going to have to do it to them. That's why Clemenceau looked at it. David Lord George, right there, he is the British Prime Minister. And Lloyd George, he actually, yeah, he wanted to punish Germany, but his big issue was, let's make sure the British Empire is protected. Let's make sure the empire is protected. And then lastly, President Wilson would go to the treaty negotiations. A lot of people told him not to. Don't do it. If the negotiations don't go well, it'll be tied to you personally. Send your Secretary of State, send advisors, send members of both parties to go. But no, Wilson, looking back at it rather arrogantly, went. And when he arrived, this is him in London, he would also go to Rome. He was met by, and this is no exaggeration, over a million people. And they cheered Wilson on. You got this, Cody? They cheered Wilson. They cheered him. He is going to bring peace. He actually really, it really went to his head. I am the peacekeeper. I am the one that would decide peace. With the 14 points, which everybody realized was unworkable. And when they got there, Clemenceau was absolutely shocked at how little David Lord George knew about Europe. Britons are notoriously ignorant about the continent. And how Wilson knew nothing. Wilson did not have a clue about European politics. Wilson did not understand the complex nationalities of Eastern Europe. Wilson did not understand what both countries went into the war. Wilson, Clement so thought, was a fool. Yes. So, and Wilson would contract the flu during the negotiations and would make it horribly ill. Well, back to what Wilson wanted. Wilson had this vague idea of the 14 points. Wilson talked about the 14 points, but he implied League of Nations. League of Nations. Did everyone got that? Wilson was going to get his League of Nations. But he would negotiate almost all the 14 points away. Not even negotiate. It would just be dictated. Clemenceau would make it clear, no, no. In fact, Clemenceau had the great comment about Wilson. When Clemenceau was asked about the 14 points in January of 1919 when the negotiations began in Paris, Clemenceau said, Wilson has his 14 points. The Lord had 10. We'll see. We'll see. Italy expected to be treated as an equal. They expected to get all kinds of land from Austria, and very quickly they were snubbed. Their prime minister, Victorio Orlando actually went back. He left the negotiations for a while and then came back and was a non entity. At first, they talked big four, but it soon became the big three. Italy, 
suffered greatly in this war. Over 2 million casualties, their economy ruined. This will directly, Italy being, as they saw it, snubbed. This will directly lead to what new form of right-wing, ultra-conservative, pro-business government? Fascism. Who would be their fascist dictator? Benito Mussolini. In a week and a half, I will show you the greatest thing ever put on film. <laughs> also, Japan. Japan expected to be treated as equal, too. They were snubbed. Japan felt snubbed. Oh, they won't forget. Anyone guess what this is going to lead to? It's going to come. We're going to have to do it ourselves. Get what we want ourselves, especially in China. That will begin the events that will lead to the Pacific Theater in World War II. Hmm? They just call it theater. It's basically that's where the war is. Just give it, they, it basically just came from the name from it. Theaters where one show was. So the Pacific show was a theater. Yeah. Um, weren't like Italy or Japan like locked in a room or something kept them in the Yeah, totally kept away. And so were the Germans. For a while, well, Italy wasn't necessarily locked away. It was more like Italy was locked out. Japan, they were literally, they were kind of like, just stay there. And no one told them and no one, and no one could speak Japanese. It was a disaster. Poor Japanese. No one did it on the train. No, it was a disaster. And the Germans were locked in a room. But one thing really quickly, Wilson's talk of self-determination, here is Wilson like arbitrating all the different agreements, like Wilson will be the judge. No, very quickly, these empires just broke into civil war. The Poles are going to make their own country. The Czechs are going to make their own country and, and force the Slovakians to go with them. The Serbs will make their own Yugoslavia. They're just going to do it. And the former Ottoman Empire, the Arabs expect their own countries. Not going to happen. That won't have long-term effects, so let's see. Let me give you a date. Today. We'll come back to that. There they are in the House of Mirrors actually signing the agreement. And what we're coming into is the meat of the treaty. Two big parts. First off, Germany is going to be forced to sign this. They didn't want it. At first, they refused. And these are the main parts. First off, Germany is going to have to take full responsibility for the war. War guilt clause. This is going to have great impact on Germany. Germany deserves most of the blame. But it's, it wasn't that simple. Next, they lost all their colonies and they lost territory within Europe. Germany lost a lot. And then you don't need to write this down, but or write down the numbers. Just put down, they limit their military greatly. Remember that 4.5 million men when the war began? Only an army of 100,000 men. Especially when the Bolsheviks might be coming. This infuriated them. But no Air Force subs, large ships, or tanks. None of these things. Germany can't do it again. The problem is they'll greatly resent this. And then France and Belgium were destroyed. They wanted reparations. They didn't decide the treaty. But eventually they would come up with a reparations of, at first it was going to be 55 billion, but it would turn out to be that Germany would pay 33 billion. Germany would pay 33 billion, and then there'd be another 22 billion that it was it was complex. Germany would pay 33, the net of 33 billion in 1919 dollars. What is that today? About 750 billion. The thought was this would destroy the German economy. A lot of people said this is insanity. How dare you do this? Germany will not recover. But it wasn't big enough to destroy their economy, but it was big enough after this treaty and punishing Germany that Germany would want what? Would, would want what? That's a lot of alliteration right there. Revenge. They would want revenge. And the last thing right down, I was hoping to get through this day, but I didn't. Well, oh, that's all the territory they lost. They lost a lot of land, including 12% of their population. This will be a little factor later on. But in the treaty, there would be a League of Nations. And there is Wilson supposedly doing the everlasting peace of the League of Nations. <laughs> but part of this would be called Article 10. 
Article 10 of the League of Nations. And that would set aside the idea of collective security. And what it would mean is that the member states, did you get Article 10 now, Christian? Quick, 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 the bell. I know, I know, I went after the bell. I'm an evil, horrible person, right? Yeah. Am I evil and horrible? Yeah. Article 10 said that all the countries of the League would use forces to stop aggression. Collectively. So before, so like before Austria attacked Serbia, all the countries would send an army and stop aggression. I think you might see a problem with that. All right, tomorrow I would like all of you to be here. If you're not here, you'll miss out on the treats. I'm going to give Chapter 25 is due on Friday. Friday will be. I don't know if the test will be Monday. I keep on forgetting that Monday's that shortened period. So we're gonna do we're gonna do the twenties.